All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here at my first Open Slava and talk a bit about quantum computing for uh, energy network optimization. First, some introductions. I'm Mats. I'm part of Accenture's Next Gen and Quantum Computing Group in Germany. I'm now almost, well, about a year at Accenture and have a background in theoretical physics. And well, without further ado, let's get into the quantum stuff and quantum optimization. So what I'm going to present is or was part of so-called Planck project that we did at Accenture, which is a quantum computing platform and consortium um, funded by the German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Right. Now, before we start with quantum, I want to set the stage and introduce you to the use case that we uh, looked at. So what we see is that the amount of green energy or energy produced by renewable means is uh, increasing. In fact, the EU has plans to have a share of more than 30 percent of green energy. So this not only includes electricity, but also heat uh, in the energy mix by 2030. And it will probably be even raised to more than 40 percent. And actually, if we look into the developments over the past, uh, in this case for Germany, the amount of renewable electricity in the network has uh, more than doubled over the last 10 years. So there's quite a lot of uh, stuff happening in the renewable energy generation. Now the question is, what does this actually mean for the energy grid? Let's look at an example from 10 years ago with um, well, the energy mix from then. As you can see, most of the energy was generated by uh, fossil means. You have the coal generation and nuclear, and then a bit of solar energy. Above. And the important thing to note here is that most of this generation is really pretty much constant. And this is what we call the base load. This is energy which is bought uh, from the energy providers months or even years ahead of time that is basically uh, uh, supplying the base demand that uh, energy users have, which does not really change over time. So looking at the current status of this, uh, we see that we have a lot of more uh, renewable energy sources. And with this, the possible base load energy that we can supply is also decreasing a lot because we do not have the capacity to supply it with, for example, coal power, power plants. So what this means is that we can't really predict in advance how much energy we will be able to uh, produce because well, we can't really tell um, how the winds will be blowing in a few weeks or how the sun will be shining. And we have to decide um, or we have to see how much energy we generate uh, pretty much one day ahead of its use. And what this creates is so-called supply-demand mismatches. So during times of high electricity production, there may be uh, times where we produce more energy than we actually need, which is here in this graph at the uh, first time step here. And in, during these times, uh, during the overproduction, we will export energy. And there are other times where we produce less, en uh, less energy than we actually need and have to import expensive energy. And this is, of course, because we can't control how much renewable energy we will actually produce at a specific time. So the question is, how do we combat this uh, without relying too much on exports and imports? And an obvious idea is to just shift energy from one time where we generate it to another time. Well, the problem here is, of course, we can't store the energy. And we don't really have a big battery um, that lets us put a lot of energy, because obviously if you look at a whole country, you produce a lot of energy um, and store it to later retrieve it again. But maybe we can use a lot of small batteries. Namely, what I'm talking about are electric vehicles. So imagine you have a really large decentralized energy storage in the form of the batteries of electric vehicles which is most of the time of the day not in use, and you are able to store energy there and retrieve it at a later time. And this concept, which I'm talking about, is vehicle to grid. So not only may an electric car 
charge energy first you need this but you may also feed in energy from the car battery into the system and well one may ask whether this uh, is feasible and the answer is yeah, it could be, because we have a lot of electric cars and the numbers are only increasing in the future. And depending on how you calculate and uh, what assumptions you can take, you can arrive at numbers up to 20% of daily energy use that could be uh, provided by the capacity of electric vehicles. Of course, there are still other considerations you have to take into account. For example, the infrastructure also has to... Uh, made ready for, for using such a system. But we're currently looking at a more or less innovative approach for this. Now, what I just talked about was the first step of what we call the quantum use case journey. So if you want to evaluate problems and solve them on quantum computers, we of course, first of all, have to find a problem that we want to solve. In this case, the use case is of using vehicle to grid, so the batteries of electric vehicles, um, to will shift network loads on the energy grid. And next up is we have to make this more precise, this problem, and have to, have to formulate a problem from this. So what we thought about is what we call the feed-in reward program. And I'm going to explain it to you now. So first of all, we want to look at the market prices. So what is happening is that energy providers are buying energy on the energy markets, which are similar to stock markets, uh, ahead of time. So for example, the baseload energy that I talked about is bought many months in advance. But there's also the day ahead market where energy is bought one day ahead of its use. And due to differing uh, energy generation scenarios, for example, it's really much better dependent how much energy and what type of energy we are going to produce. These prices are fluctuating a lot. But the utility provider is selling its energy to the end users at a fixed price most of the times. So there are times on the day where the market price is higher than the sell price and times where it's lower. And this obviously means that the utility provider has a loss and the price is higher and makes profits when it's lower. Ideally, from the perspective of the utility provider, we would only have these uh, green areas because, well, we want to make profit first. But as you may guess, the demand uh, does not really care about the time when the energy is bought. So we always have a demand and this demand always has to be satisfied. So what can we do about this? And at this stage, the feed and reward program comes in. And um, suppose we can offer the electric vehicle users a price for buying energy from their cars which would then be fed into the network via vehicle to grid. Doing this, we can, on the one hand, reduce the cost a utility provider has at this time, and we also can generate profit for the electric vehicle user. So in this case, it's a win-win situation for both parties. And most importantly, here, we do take the energy from the batteries, from the temporary storage. So in this case, we reduce the energy which is needed from the generation. And of course, the cars need to be recharged one time, and therefore we are able to shift energy loads. So by utilizing this feed and reward pro program uh, cleverly, we are able to achieve what we set out to do, namely uh, shifting energy network loads to different times of the day. Well, now we have to think about how we want to price this. And depending on the price that we offer EV users, um, of course, their willingness to participate in such a pro program uh, changes. And we have to find the optimal prices for this and the optimal times in which we offer these prices um, to get the most benefit out of this program. So in the next step, we need to formulate this business problem in a mathematical way. So, of course, we need to take some assumptions, for example, the time granularity in which we want to consider our model in our case, we took a one hour time window. And so we had 24 time steps per day. You also have some constraints, how you want to model the elasticity between the offered price and the number of people participating. In our case, we took it to be linear. And um, 
then you need to take into consideration uh, well, the preferences of the users because there are times of the day where they may uh, drive to work and their car won't be available. And they maybe also don't want to offer the full capacity of their car for this program. So we have a lot of constraints uh, to work here with. And of course, we need good data of the energy markets, how much energy demand has been forecasted, how much energy has been generated, what are the prices, and also of course, uh, user behavior. And then what we can do is create a formula that we want to optimize. In this case, we want to find the optimal feed and prices. And the function we want to maximize is in this case the profit. So what we take here is a sum of all the incomes and expenses of the utility provider. And the incomes uh, are made up of the demand, of course, of the energy that is sold. And the expenses is the energy that we need to buy from base load sources, from the, from the head market, or from the feed-in program. Now, we can plug all these quantities into this formula. And in the end, we get a mathematical problem that we are able to solve now. And well, of course, this. It, it, in reality, it's a bit more complicated because these quantities also depend on the prices and there are a few more things and constraints there, but in the end, we have a constrained critic program here. Now, you may be asking, <laughs> where is the quantum stuff? And yes, we're coming to it in a bit. But the thing is, and that's really important to note here, is that in order to be able to do something for a quantum computer, solve a problem on the quantum computer, there is a lot of preparation needed because, of course, we want to treat important use cases. We want to have a good problem to solve them. And also, we need good data. So we need to have a lot of preparation. And we're not done yet because at the current step, we have a classical problem. And this classical problem can be used, can be solved on a classical computer. But quantum computers, work quite differently than classical computers. And they can't take every problem that a classical computer can. So we can't really just put this problem that I just took, uh, just showed you and put it on the quantum computer. We have to bring it into a quantum suitable form. So first step is that we need to reformulate or bring it into another uh, formulation um, that can be solved in a quantum computer. And this also depends on the different types of architecture of quantum computers and the algorithms that you, we want to use for this. And there's another really important thing to note here. At the current stage of technology, quantum computers are still in really early stages. And we can't expect to solve every problem that we can solve classically on a quantum computer just yet. We have to be really careful on the problem sizes because we can't really go too big. Um, because the quantum computers are not big yet enough. And also quantum computers are noisy. So we have to do special treatments to our algorithms to get uh, good results. Now, having this, first of all, the transforming of the problem and also making sure that this problem is optimized for a quantum computer, now we can actually get into solving the problem in quantum. Looking back onto our quantum use case journey. We are now in the quantum realm, I would say, with having a quantum suitable problem formulation. And the next step is then putting this problem onto a quantum computer, solving it. And of course, we want to evaluate this problem. We want to benchmark it, compare it to classical solution. And always we want to try out different approaches because there is not the best approach to solve uh, a problem on a quantum computer. There are many different algorithms and things you can do. So usually these three last steps here are a repeating process. And also, if we're considering multiple use cases, um, these steps repeat themselves a lot. And we do a lot of things uh, multiple times. So what we do is that we use so-called accelerators to accelerate the, the rate in, we, in which we can evaluate such problems for quantum proof of, proof of concept development. For example, we use a proof of concept template to quickly set up project structure for such quantum computing projects. And we developed a modular optimization framework 
which already implements a lot of common problems, algorithms, and also backends to solve the problems. Let me quickly explain you how this framework works. So what we started with is a use case, in this case, the feed and reward program. And first step that we took is that we formulated as a mathematical problem. In this case, it was a constraint quadratic program. And this program can then be solved on a classical optimizer, really straightforwardly. Now, for a quantum computer, we need to reformulate this into a quantum suitable way, in this case, uh, a cubo. And the optimization framework has the capability to automatically convert these types of problem into one another so, so that we don't have to do this manually. We can use many methods to optimize the problem formulation this way. And of course, there are a lot of other different problems that we may take a look at and a lot of other different classical and quantum solvers that we want to try to solve our problem on. And really important, we want to use quantum computers. So we need to be able to connect to backends. And usually what is done is that the quantum computers are offered by our cloud services, for example, IBM Quantum. And this optimization framework can directly plug into this backend and solve them on the quantum computer. Now, afterwards, we have a quantum solution and we need to transform it back to the uh, business solution. In this case, would be the prices of the feed and reward program and the times in which they would be offered. All right, now let's look at some results and I want to use a showcase that we built for this. So I will just quickly change uh, windows and I hope it works. Yes, you can see. So we can now uh, look at a few different types of results and algorithms that we used. Uh, let's start with the classical one. So what we could do on the classical backend is that we could solve the full year of this feed and reward program. So a pretty big problem. Um, and let's look at uh, the results here. So what you can see here is are, are the market prices, which are, as I said, really much fluctuating. And sometimes they are a lot higher than the uh, tariff or demand price, and sometimes they are lower. And depending on this, we are able to use the feed and reward program to increase the profits. So we can are able to optimize uh, our problem here in this case. And in total, what we found is that compared to the problem without the feed and reward program, we were able to increase the profit by approximately 2 billion euros, which is pretty big. But of course, this also heavily depends on the type of assumptions that you take for your, for your problem. So first take this with a grain of salt. Next up, we solved the problem on a quantum computer. In this case, it was a 27 qubit system from IBM. And we were able, with a clever formulation of the problem, um, as I told you, it's really important to get the problem formulation right, to solve one full day of this feed and reward program on the quantum computer. And here's how the results look. First of all, these are user profiles, so constraints which incorporate user driving behaviors. And the green time slots here are the times where we actually have the feed and reward program enabled. And here you can see how much of the energy then is provided by this feed and reward program in green. And this in the bottom here are the prices then that are offered. And as you can see, we always use the feed and reward program in, in cases where the uh, market prices are higher than the offered demand prices. Mm -hmm. Right. Finally, um, let's look at an example of a quantum inspired algorithm. So these are algorithms which are executed on a classical machine, but uh, based on quantum principles. Now, um, this is a scenario here where we have a net loss over this uh, time frame of two days, and we were able to cut losses with this. And um, you can see here that we take energy from times where the energy is really expensive and shift the load to times where the energy is a lot less expensive. All right. Now, let's just quickly summarize what I just said. 
and highlight the, the main points here. So first of all, which is really cool, is that we could solve a more or less practical problem of one full day on a quantum computer. And of course, if you compare it to the classical solution here on the left, um, the performance of the quantum solution is not better. It's comparable, but not better. But still, um, the quantum computers are in early stages, so it's quite cool that we were able to solve a full day. And the other example with the quantum inspired solver that I showed you is pretty much on par with the classical benchmark solution. And in this case, we had a really hard instance. So in this case here, the problem was pretty non-convex, meaning uh, hard. And in these edge cases, the quantum inspired solution actually was as fast as the classic solution. So there are cases, or there may be cases of problem instances, which are really hard, more hard than usual, where we can actually have quite a benefit then of, for example, quantum inspired or in the future quantum solution. Now, looking at the performance, the question may now be whether, well, is quantum then even viable if we can't get the same performance as the classical solution? And well, if you look at the time the problem takes to run, the accuracy of the problem, or um, the sizes of problems that we could uh, run. So in this case, we were only able to have 27 variables in our problem, which is, is not bad, but it's quite the maximum that we could do in this case here. So yes, quantum computers at the current stage are not better than classical computers for most instances. But um, this is not really the point of what we're doing here, because we're exploring the technology and we are building a bridge towards the future where the technology is in a ready state to be used, building up expertise and looking at important problems from an innovative angle. So even though the performance may not be on par at the moment, could be in the future and most importantly for really hard problems. Um, another point I want to make is that evaluating these uh, quantum use cases is not always only about quantum computing. Because as I said, you have to be really careful when uh, formulating your problems for a quantum computer. And by looking into this problem then uh, really deeply and uh, closely, you may find ways to even optimize the classical problem and even generate benefits on the classical side. And we have seen this in previous use case that we uh, worked on at Accenture. And um, right, so quantum may not only be about quantum in this case. Okay, so the main takeaways um, I want to highlight here from this talk is that well, even though quantum may not be practical today, it's uh, always already as we can already already solve practical problems on a quantum computer. And this might not be expected. And uh, another thing which I find really important is to reuse things that we do. So by using our framework, our optimization framework, we are able to rapidly evaluate different use cases in different ways. And this is also a lot, uh, a main point of what we do is to find out about, about many algorithms and many backends and try them out to get a big, a better view about um, the problem landscape and what is possible. Now, the last thing is that, well, as I already highlighted a few times, that going the journey of the quantum use case, um, we are able to get even benefits today by finding ways to optimize our problems by looking at them in a more deeper angle. And also, from my point of view, um, it's really fun <laughs> to look at these uh, important problems from innovative point of views and explore novel approaches to solving difficult problems. And um, well, final note I want to make is that we use our accelerators to build the quantum fraud detection app. And because of the modularity that we 
were able to leverage. It took us only uh, one month, which is uh, not a lot of time, in my opinion. And I even, so we will have a demo after this talk in the exhibition area. And if you want, you can check out what we built and uh, we can talk a bit more about all these topics. And right with that, uh, thank you really much for being here. I was happy to talk about quantum with you and thank you. Thank you, but we still have questions. Uh, charging additional charging cycles will lead to increased battery decay. How did you price this into the model? Yes, thank you for the question. This is a really important thing. And at the current stage of the, the model, it is not incorporated. And of course, if you want to take this use case further and maybe look into really implementing it in some way, you have, of course, to take into account that because you charge and feed in more with your car, the battery degrades. And of course, this could be implemented by some constraints on the cycles that you want to have uh, for your car or even as an additional cost term to the optimization function that maybe, um, well, penalizes really high uh, decay. So at the current stage, it is not implemented, but it definitely is a possibility to go further with this use case, of course. Okay. So how many cars do you estimate are needed to store the energy so that demand meets the offer on energy market? So in my opinion, I think we don't want to store all the energy that is uh, produced. So we only have to take some percentage and you can do rough calculations and look at how many uh, electric vehicles are currently on the market or will be in the future, how much capacity they have. And you can say, well, maybe people only want to leverage half of the capacity and they want to have 50% always available to them because well, maybe you uh, need to drive somewhere in an emergency. And um, with these calculations, I got to about, in the best cases, to 20% and in the worst cases, less. Okay. Um, so, uh, so the point is that you are building more a framework for future use cases to help them solve the optimization problem by the quantum computing. Well, yes and no. So, when we initially uh, treated this use case, we did all this from scratch. All the optimization routines and all the backend uh, adapters we we wrote them new and what we what we noticed is that there are a lot of steps that happen a lot of times and we can speed up the process by building this and transforming this what we did uh, into a framework and reusing the steps that we are taking a lot of times so um, the first point was to treat this use case, but it also developed into uh, building this uh, framework. Yeah. Okay, back to the grid approach is very interesting. However, it also requires all the cars to be connected to the grid while parked. So it's not a question, it's a statement, yes, right? That's true, of course. And like, but yeah. how you are going to solve this issue? I think that's the yes, of course, implementation of this is really another question and we're talking about these concepts and thinking about ways to maybe leverage this but having the infrastructure ready and not even not all cars are uh, capable of doing a feed-in so they usually only are able to be charged this is, is changing but um, most of the cars currently don't have this capability and of course the grid also needs to be able to uh, receive energy from a lot of decentralized sources. So in the on the implementation side, there are a lot of things that still need to be uh, thought out. Of course. Yeah. Um, the next question is, isn't the feed-in reward similar to a fluctuating gas prices? 
reduce the price of charging when supply will lead to demand for energy and vice versa. So it's it will be somehow a cycle. Mm. I'm not sure if I understand the question quite right, but um it's that you will lead with this, like to increasing and decreasing price, and so there will be no like sense for this. I that's the, well, it. Is, it is similar, like gas price. Of course, you have like another another source of energy with a different pricing structure, and in the end, this may uh, also have a back reaction to the markets and how the energy prices develop there. So that uh, depending on on how large you you make this, um, that could potentially happen, yes, I think so. Um, what if this problem would be analyzed just based on, on one parameter, grid frequency shifting, and would regulate the excess capacity based on the measured value? Mm. Yes, I think um, this is actually something that is done currently also. So the energy grid has to be at a stable frequency all the times. And if there is too much supply or too much demand, and we have these supply demand mis mismatches at a point of time, then the frequency changes and all the entities, uh, all the participants of the energy grid um, have measures in place to then temporarily increase uh, the energy supply or decrease uh, the energy supply or generate additional demand. But thing is that uh, these uh, balancing measures are really expensive and um, mostly arise because of um, because we can't always predict uh, how much energy is generated and uh, demanded at uh, one day ahead or a few moments uh, ahead and um, by bettering this prediction um, also for example with such a feed and reward program um, that we are able to balance the grid better, um, we would uh, be able to avoid these uh, frequency shift. Yeah. Thank you. And we have the last question. What if you would regulate the consumption, like as an example, HVAC of building uh, buildings houses, or give incentives to factories to act based on that? Sure, you can do this. These are all really cool ideas to to help uh, balance the energy grid. And I'm pretty sure that they are also thought about by the energy providers and generators. Um, yeah, you could uh, do something like this, I believe. Yeah. Okay, so that was our last question. Thank you very much. Thank you.